Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join our webinar today. My name is Brian Robinson, and I'll kind of be your host for this afternoon and evening. Uh, and uh, with me, I also have Jason from Australia. Jason, are you there? Thanks, Brian. Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to say a quick welcome to part two of uh, Silence Hacking Exposed, which is pre presented by Brian Robeson, who is our chief evangelist. Um, my role at Silence is the country manager for Australia and New Zealand, and this is the APAC uh, regional time slot. Of course, we may have some attendees from around the world, but wanted to make sure that uh, you have a nice local uh, presence on the webinar as well. Um, part one was last week. I know some of you attended and it was great to see some insights uh, that Brian had on, on some of the attack simulations that we are uh, looking to cover in this presentation. So today is all about how silence can help you prevent um, succumbing to one of those attacks. So without further ado, as, as per last week, um, Brian will, will lead the session. Um, there is the question, uh, the question and answer uh, widget at the bottom of the Zoom. So feel free to please ask questions as you're going along. And I hope you enjoy the show. So Brian, back over to you. Great. Thanks, Jason. And, uh, you know, really love having uh, all of you guys on the on the line today and uh, really appreciate it. Um, and thank you uh, for taking the time out of your day and joining us. Uh, just as Jason said, a little housekeeping here. Audio probably sounds the best stream through your computer, although there are local numbers to dial into. Um, the QA widget is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you're doing, if you're viewing full screen, you might have to wiggle your rodent or your mouse a little bit to get that Q&A widget to pop up. Uh, or if you're viewing in a window, it should be down there and should be good to go. Uh, obviously, the links uh, will be sent out to the recording of this as well as the presentation. So if you have to leave, uh, hopefully it's not because of a security incident, but if you do have to leave, uh, feel confident that you're going to get the full content of the deck as well as the uh, demonstrations that we're going to be doing today. Uh, feedback is absolutely essential. I would love to hear what you guys uh, want to see in future Hacking Exposed webinars. We have some topics we have backlogged and we'd like to get to them, but obviously if there is something specific that you guys uh, out there would like to see, please, please, please feel free to reach out and send that information over to me. And uh, there's my email address right there on the screen, brobison at silence.com. Send me an email if you have questions. Uh, concerns, ideas, all that kind of cool stuff, please do reach out. If you need help with the webinar platform, our wonderful assistant Shirley is online and she will look for those in the Q&A um, or you can send a chat to the panelists and she will be able to uh, help you with that. Uh, also, you can email uh, our webinar team at webinars at silence.com. So any feedback you have on the platform or questions, um, if we can get those addressed, we will do so as quickly as possible. Uh, as Jason said, my name is Brian Robison. I'm the chief evangelist here at BlackBerry Silence. Um, hopefully, it's as uh, like last week, Stuart's uh, travel schedule can be kind of erratic at times, but hopefully, um, we will get to hear from him today. He is traveling, and but uh, he did want to try to jump in and, and spend some time with us today. So if we do see him, uh, I will uh, make sure that we get uh, to talk with him. But a lot of times he loves doing these things, um, although as you can probably imagine, his current role um, in, in, uh, in the company is uh, very, very busy. So I'll pretty much, uh, at least I can be here on most of these. All right, so just the same as we did last week, um, we're gonna run through a couple of older things uh, that we, have seen that are still able to bypass a lot of next-gen technology. And then we're gonna run through three primary new methods that we're gonna look at, leveraging trusted execution, we're gonna do some hiding in plain sight, and then we're gonna play with some memory. And uh, then we're going to have a big bang and then we're gonna close kind of by summarizing some of the technologies that you see today. Now, like Jason said, this purpose of this webinar is to see how silence technology is going to defend 
and prevent the attacks that we've shown you last week. So we're going to do the same demonstrations, but this time our hapless victim systems are going to be fully protected with Silence Technology, our full AI platform, and you will be able to see those different things in action as we move through. Okay, so um, just a real quick summary. Again, where did these attacks actually come from? Well, these are real world attacks uh, that were essentially reverse engineered from customers who hired our professional services. So they hired us to come in and either stop a breach that was currently happening, you know, containing that incident or, uh, you know, figuring out what happened. And as part of that investigation, one of the things that we did, and one of the things that customers wanted to understand was how did that attack actually bypass the awesome latest, you know, greatest next gen technologies that they have deployed both on the endpoint and in the gateway. So uh, we looked at that and that gave us basically a lot of different techniques that can be used. So during that reverse engineering process, we essentially, again, basically kind of come out with that technique. Uh, and we also track on researchers dedicated to bypassing, you know, security technology, whether it's next gen or traditional or whatever, because by monitoring that and keeping an eye on that information and those people as well, uh, it just makes us all better in the long run. And it does help us become a better security solution when we can uh, keep an eye and, and work with the people whose jobs are to basically bypass uh, technology. Okay, so once we have gathered all that data, we then uh, essentially remove any of the proprietary components of those attacks. So the software that's written by the attackers themselves, we yank those out because we don't want to do the bad stuff. And we try to replace as, as close to as possible techniques uh, that, that are there with tools that we all have access to. So you're going to see a lot of things, you know, use Metasploit. You're going to see, uh, you know, Trevor C2, Cactus Torch, all these different technologies are available to you. And what we're doing here is using those newer, uh, those available tools to replicate the techniques. And lastly, again, just like last week, this is not about product naming or shaming. Um, I will never mention which, you know, vendor was bypassed or whatever, except I will tell you, um, you know, if certain elements of these attacks do bypass silence technology, I will absolutely be open and honest about what can get around silence technology. And then we will also show you um, you know, how to cover those and mitigate those. So again, this is about education, about the techniques that are being used with tools that you can replicate these attacks in your own environment. So with that preface, let's go ahead and get into gear here. Now, the first thing that we're going to talk about, very basically like we did last time, there are old hacks that were essentially talked about in the very, very first Hacking Exposed first edition um, that Stuart talked about in that book. And there's things like file pumping and binary padding. So adding a bunch of fake data to a file, even today, um, you know, vendors create performance trade-offs or cloud upload de decision trade-offs so that if the file is of a certain size or if is of a certain you know, caliber, it's simply just not going to block it from running. So a very, very easy thing to do. Also, we see uh, as, you know, moving around executable malware, for example, exe files becomes more difficult. Uh, we see attackers moving more to back towards old style technologies uh, and techniques like DLL hijacking or sideloading, where you're basically utilizing trusted execution models that are already on the systems, essentially living off the land with tools that already exist on those endpoints and are already trusted by all of the technologies that are there to, you know, prevent you from running something that's untrusted. We're also seeing some really massive work in command obfuscation. We're going to take a look at a very simple example today 
but there are some really awesome command obfuscations to obfuscate PowerShell um, commands as well as things like VB script code where you know the attacker creates their entire brand new character map inside the VB script itself and then uh, you know uses that to create their code and it's just really crazy looking. Um, unhooking processes in user land, this has been something that's been around for 15 years or more and is still, you know, utilized today against a lot of the technology that exists. So, um, you know, this is basically just, you know, not self-protecting your own tools. And uh, yeah, you leave yourself open to just being removed from the system or, or shut down and, and then therefore you can get bypassed. Now, and I don't know if this is something that is just in my brain or if it's something that actually is there, but we saw two kind of buzzwords being utilized at the same time. Obviously, first, there was the marketing buzzword of cloud. Everything is in the cloud. And that came very shortly, very shortly after that came all of these traditional tech, all these traditional security companies talking about how their solutions now use the cloud and becoming quote next gen solutions. And so it's almost synonymous, it's almost interesting, but it seems like the word next gen is almost synonymous with the cloud. And so these technologies, uh, what's on the endpoint is essentially their 20 year old technology and they have some really cool technology in the cloud. Maybe they're using AI or ML to do a bunch of, you know, analysis or whatever in the cloud. But if you take that cloud connection away from that endpoint, you still are basically just faced with your uh, latest and greatest version of your signatures or your rule based or your behavioral engine that's sitting on the endpoint. So um, this is something that I, I really like to do is to show people how these things react when they do not have uh, internet connectivity because it's it's you're left with whatever is on that endpoint to do any sort of protection and in a lot of cases that might be you know some 20 year old technology okay so let's get into the meat of our presentation because we have about 45 minutes left and I want to uh, keep us on time today but there's some pretty cool things that we're going to talk about so the first thing we're gonna to do today is we're gonna talk about leveraging trusted execution. And specifically, we are going to use Cactus Torch with an HTA file. Now, I don't wanna go into a whole bunch of background about what Cactus Torch is and all that kind of stuff. It's here in the slide deck for reference and we did do it last week. So if you um, didn't get last week's recording or weren't able to obtain it, um, it should be online, silence.com slash webinars very shortly, if not already out there. But please review that if you want to kind of get a better understanding of Cactus Torch. But the main goal here of Cactus Torch is that it allows us to deliver shellcode into memory, and we can do it with multiple types of software payloads. We can do it with Visual Basic. We can do it with JavaScript. We can do it with WScript. We can do it with HTA. And so what is it um, really? And basically what it does is it allows you to choose a binary, any binary that's already on the system, like run DLL32 as an example. You build some shell code, you base64 encode it so that the shell code is less detectable by static um, rules engines. And you then deliver it into a file. And for example, we're going to use HTA which is actually going to use MSHTA to execute that shellcode. And because MSHTA is a trusted Microsoft application and so is run DLL32, the HTA executes. Now specifically, what about this? Why does this actually bypass next gen? Well, just like with silence, the technologies really are designed to block JavaScript or VBScript or PowerShell and other types of scripting languages. And that's why using HTA is very specifically, um, you know, very good at doing a bypass. And it's because it uses that trusted relationship with MSHTA. Um, and it also is quite difficult to see because of the obfuscated commands 
And then if you're using Metasploit, let's say with a reverse um, you know, SSH interpreter, things like that, uh, then things get uh, pretty good at hiding. Now, just like last week, I do want to caution you when you're doing your own testing like this, um, you'll probably find that when you use a tool like Metasploit, you get caught a lot. And you get caught by endpoint technologies, you get caught by gateway technologies, you get caught by IPS technologies, and that's all fine and dandy, but all you're really doing at that point is you're testing the vendor's ability to write signatures to detect Metasploit. And as, as you, if you remember from last week, there at the very end, we uh, did get a detection from uh, Microsoft Windows Defender because of the Metasploit payload. And I did that so that I could highlight to you the fact that uh, you know, vendors who write signatures for Metasploit, that's fine and dandy, which it, it makes it difficult for you guys to test your own networks. And it also you know, takes out the 12 year old script kitties or whatever who might use Metasploit as their attack platform. But all it does is block Metasploit. It doesn't block the technique being used. And so therefore, they're not solving the problem, they're just writing more signatures. So keep an eye out for that. Okay, we've got the same exact setup that we had last week. We've got attacker stuff on the left and we got victim stuff on the right. Uh, in the attacker for the different demos that we're gonna be doing, it basically is um, a Kali Linux box that we have set up to do a bunch of different things. It's gonna run Metasploit listeners. It's gonna run, uh, you know, we're gonna build our payloads there. It's, we're gonna build our Cactus Torch files. We're gonna have simple web servers and things like that all set up on that machine. On the right-hand side, we've got a victim. Uh, and just like last week, we are not focused in this webinar on you know, how to compromise a website to deliver these files or how to build really cool phishing, um, you know, email schemes and things like that. We're just gonna move the file over from the victim to the attacker because we're just gonna assume that that file is there uh, or has gotten there somehow. And really the goal of this is to see the action that happens when that file actually ends up on the endpoint anyway. So again, we're not concerned about how the file gets there but we are concerned about what it does when it actually does arrive. So with that, let's go ahead and switch over to our demo and we'll take a look at Cactus Torch and HTA. Okay, we are now looking at demo. Now, uh, again, just like last week, same setup, victim, uh, sorry, attackers on the left and victim on the right. And so we'll go ahead and begin uh, setting some of this stuff up. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create um, a very simple, just a little Python simple web server on port 8080. Now, again, all this is, uh, is uh, just so that we can move the files from the attacker over to our victim very easily. This way we're not gonna have to fire up any sort of um, you know, fake compromised websites or anything. Again, we're, we're focusing on what the files do once they're on the endpoint, not necessarily how they, uh, how they get there. Oops. All right, so in the top left here, we're gonna go ahead and build our um, shellcode payload. And to do that, we're going to uh, use my han han uh, handy dandy cut and paste method because again, I, uh, sometimes I make typos and this allows us to just very quickly create the different elements. Using MSF Venom, we're gonna build a 32-bit shell, a reverse shell. We're gonna point it back at our Kali Linux box and we're going to use port 444 and we're gonna output that into this output.bin file. Now, the output.bin file could potentially get picked up in line, in transit, IPS, static scanners, all that kind of fun stuff. So we're gonna take that output file and we're going to base64 encode it. And this helps circumvent um, the technologies that are out there um, that can do that, uh, that can look, to, look at that for specific strings. And so then we're gonna take that base64 code and we're going to drop it out to our screen. And as you can see here, instead of you know, a payload 
um, with potential strings in it, we now have a base64 encoded command that we can uh, create and put into our file. All right. So here in Cactus Torch, this is the default um, distribution of Cactus Torch right off of GitHub. You can see that it has lots and lots of different types of files, HTA, JavaScript, VB, um, all kinds of different files that you can utilize. And like I said earlier, we're gonna focus on the HTA file. So in the HTA file, um, the instructions are quite simple. They only need to modify a few things. Um, basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick a binary that you're going to inject into. Uh, as it says here, the default is run DLL 32 exe. Um, but pretty much any, you know, um, executable that's in uh, you know, system 32 or syswow will pretty much work. Um, you can use notepad or calc or whatever. Then we're gonna generate, which we already did, we generated our 32-bit shellcode in whatever framework you want. You can use Cobalt Strike or Metasploit. Again, using public frameworks like this is raises your chances of getting caught. Uh, and then you base 64 in code, just like we did and you copy the block into the code variable below. So here we pick uh, run DLL 32, and we've got our code block that we're gonna paste in here between the quotes. And that's pretty much it. Cactus Torch does all of the rest. It does all of the base 64 decoding into a stream. It does all of the other elements that are necessary. And that's what's fun about Cactus Torch is that it's so easy to use. Literally, you just solve these two or three different questions and off you go. All right, so just like last time, we're gonna start a netcat listener on port 444, listening for that reverse shell to come back to our uh, attacker system. So on our victim, we are going to simply just browse to that simple web server down here. Because again, like I said, we're just gonna move the file over. We're not focused on, on actually like hacking web servers and things like that uh, yet. That might be a cool one to do in the future. But at least for right now, we have Cactus Torch sitting on our victim system. Now, this victim is the same as it was last time. This is obviously a Windows 7 victim. We've got some you know, victim files sitting here on the desktop. We got photographs, PDFs, spreadsheets, all that kind of fun stuff. The main difference is, is that this one now has uh, Silence uh, technology installed. And in fact, it has our entire Silence AI platform, which includes both Protect as well as Optics, which is our prevention first detect and respond technology. And you're gonna see that um, in action today when we actually do some things where we're gonna bypass Silence Protect. So that'll be kind of fun. We're gonna take a look at that in a few minutes. So this endpoint is essentially protected with uh, silence at this point. Okay, so if you remember last time, all we had to do was basically double click on Cactus Torch and it's going to call up run DLL 32, which is then gonna be instructed to execute MSHTA. And then uh, the MSHTA is gonna execute this HTA file and inject the payload and we should get a connection back to our um, attacker over here on the left if this actually does work. So here we go. So we execute it and it did execute, but what we see over here is that Silence has actually stepped in and saw MSHTA attempt to do something bad. And in fact, if you look at this, what you can see is that MSHTA attempted to inject a malicious payload into memory. And so Silence Protect with its anti-exploitation technology, we call it memory defense or memdef, uh, stepped in and actually did um, what it's supposed to do. It prevented the code from getting into memory and then it prevented the execution of that code in memory, obviously, because we never did get that reverse shell back like we got uh, last week. So yay, demo one actually did work. We wanted to block and we actually did. So that is awesome. And so now we're just gonna reset a little bit. And so that was essentially utilizing trusted execution and looking at uh, MSHTA. 
and I'm hoping people, okay, there we go. I'm hoping people can hear me. We had a, I had a little power bump there. And uh, if you heard some screaming in the background, that was my UPSs kicking in. But anyway, um, that we have, so, so we've, taken, we've taken a look at trusted execution with HTA. Okay, now this one is a fun demo. If you remember from last week, this one's pretty complex to set up, but it has, you know, next gen bypasses all the way through it, including uh, endpoint as well as gateway and firewall and all that kind of fun stuff. So this one I really like. Uh, and this one, we're actually going to weaponize it with and deliver it with a weaponized document. So as you know, I have a lot of affinity for Dave Kennedy's Trevor C2. This is a fantastic uh, command and control. The cool thing is, is it's not caught like Metasploit is. Um, and so again, I'm not going to go into too much depth about Trevor C2 right now, but um, suffice to say, this is a very cool tool if you're trying to uh, emulate a command and control where they're not using something like Cobalt Strike or Metasploit, where they actually wrote their own command and control or they have a client-based command and control. This is a really cool tool for you and your arsenal to, to utilize. Uh, and then of course, we're going to weaponize this with um, some macro and we're gonna use some obfuscated visual basic code to, to execute it. So again, why does it bypass? Well, it's not injecting shell code into memory. It is a native client. It's almost just like installing a, a VPN client on your machine or something. It, it's, it's just native code that executes. And we are going to use some techniques and methods to um, weaponize the documents. Some of the techniques we've seen in the wild with APT32 or Ocean Lotus, um, using some obfuscated commands. And in fact, because this is launching from PowerShell, um, and this, isn't, this is something that a lot of people probably actually don't know, but by default, Windows will not let you just grab a PS1 file and execute it. If you've ever tried that, uh, you get blocked because PowerShell uh, you know, is blocked by default uh, in Windows. You just can't run a PS1. So you can't, you can just grab the Trevor C2 PS1 client if you want and copy it over to the endpoint and try to run it and you're gonna get blocked by uh, Microsoft. However, there are many, many ways to bypass that PowerShell execution policy uh, and the easiest way to bypass it is to simply use PowerShell and call it from Microsoft Office. For some reason, that's allowed, I guess. So um, it bypasses all of that PowerShell execution policy. Um, and you can even do something as simple as, you know, dash exec space bypass on the command line, and it will bypass the execution um, technology prevention that's there. Uh, and lastly, this one's kind of cool because the way it downloads and executes the PowerShell code, it does it directly into memory. There, there is no file on disk to pick up with a static scanner or anything like that. So again, same setup, attacker on the left, victim on the right. Um, and we're going to use, we're going to add another element to this one where we're actually going to set up a web dev server um, to move laterally throughout our network. And that's what kind of makes this one fun as well. All right, so hiding in plain sight with Trevor C2 and malicious documents. Okay, over to our victim, and we're just gonna clean up our victim for a second here. Just delete our HTA. Okay. So on our client over here, we're going to, let's drop into here. Um, we're going to start our Trevor server. And what I'd like to do is just talk just for a second about Trevor. Um, again, I, I love Trevor. It's very easy to set up. And it starts by, all you have to do is tell it what website you want it to clone. So as I said last week, what it does is it will clone a website and set up a local cached version of that website for you, for it to serve up all of its files from. <laughs> And that allows the command and control to actually be going to, let's say, a legitimate site. Maybe you have uh, an access point you fire up in a hotel with the same name, 
and you clone the hotel's, you know, login page or EULA acceptance page or whatever it is, and you use that to deliver your code to your victims. Maybe you trick them into downloading a security patch or something like that. So you pick a site to clone. Um, you could even do, you know, Yahoo or Google or whatever you wanted. And there are, you know, there, there are some potential ways to stop Trevor with a traditional rules-based engine. And the way to do that is to pick up the URL path that it uses. But the cool thing is, is with Trevor, you can literally set these paths and these directory names to be anything you want. So yeah, you might be able to find a system that will block Trevor from a, a rule standpoint um, with its defaults, but all you really have to do is change from the defaults to something else and Trevor can't be seen again. Um, you've got SSL if you want. Uh, this requires you to use a certificate obviously and uh, by using a certificate that can be part of a validation or an invalidation uh, process as well from a protection standpoint. But by default, you don't even need to use HTTPS because this is the cipher string. So this is the string that is used to essentially encode um, all of the base 64 commands. And again, this is the default one it comes with. So if you took, put this into your you know, IPS rules, your IDS rules or whatever, and try to, you know, find base 64 strings and decode them using this string, you might get lucky and catch somebody who's using this by default, but all you would have to do is change this cipher string a little bit and uh, you're going to be able to bypass those rules. So very, very easy, very, very quick to set up. A really cool tool. I really suggest you guys look into it. Uh, it's a great ad for your arsenal. So, uh, we're just going to start the Python server and the Trevor C2 server. Oops. And it's basically going to clone the local website that's running on this Kali box. And it's going to set up its own Trevor C2 server. This one happens to be on port 8080. Um, and uh, it's ready to roll. Okay. So. Uh, what we're going to do next, uh, we're going to need some more Trevor work here, but first what we're going to do is we're going to stop our default Apache service on our Kali box because we're going to end up stomping on the ports if we uh, start up a bunch of stuff. Uh, so we're going to stop that port 80 web server that we actually cloned up here and we, we don't even need it anymore. It's already cloned uh, up here, so we, we don't need that. All right, now. Let me pop over to my cut and paste notes because again, this is so much easier with these really long commands to just simply cut and paste this in. So uh, we are going to be using a PowerShell command and the PowerShell command we're going to be using is a pretty standard off the shelf, um, you know, net web client dot download string type of uh, PowerShell download to download the Trevor C2 PS1 which is the client. Now, we're going to um, base64 encode this command because many rules-based engines and EDRs and even human threat hunters are going to easily see that this is a web download attempted by PowerShell. So by simply running this through, um, you know, conversion of to, 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 to UTF-16 and then base64, we create a string here that is the PowerShell command, but it's not statically um, visible saying, you know, things like download string, et cetera. So uh, makes, it, makes it a little bit more difficult to see. Uh, now, uh, okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create this little text file called a client.txt. And this file is actually what's going to contain our PowerShell um, <clears throat> command, and we're going to make it hide the PowerShell window, uh, which is okay. And then we're going to tell it that it's an encoded command, and we're going to paste our base64 string in there. So this is a, the client that we're actually going to use, and this client um, is essentially uh, going to execute PowerShell hidden window, and here's the encoded command. So if you looked at this from a static standpoint, um, there's nothing gonna be here that's gonna say, oh yeah, that is a PowerShell download command. 
and it's going to go download a specific PowerShell file. And not much there. All right, so to deliver that file to the endpoint, we're going to just use one of our simple web servers again here. And we're going to put this on port 8090 because our Trevor C2 server is listening on port 8080. All right, down here at the bottom, we're going to use this just like we did last week. We're going to set up our little funny web dev server. And this is what we're going to use to actually host internally within this uh, victim. We're going to use this to host the uh, client.txt file. All right, so there's our web dev server. Okay, over on our victim, uh, again, we can test to make sure that our web dev server comes up. It's usually a good idea to make sure that you do that uh, if you're doing some self-testing, just to make sure that your Windows clients can successfully authenticate and negotiate into web dev. And uh, yep, so there you go. There's the client.txt file that we just created. Here's the Trevor client PS1 file that we're gonna actually uh, that the client.txt is going to execute to download this from the web server and then execute it in the memory. Okay, so we're going to disconnect from that network drive. We've verified we can actually connect to it. So we're going to disconnect and now we're going to switch gears and build our weaponized document. All right, so building a weaponized document in Microsoft Word is quite easy. Um, we can start with a blank document. We go into view, macros, create a macro. We'll just call it auto run as an example. Make sure you're putting that macro into the proper document and click create. So here is our macro. Uh, and then we're gonna replace that with the macro that I have here. All right, so this is the macro that's gonna do the magic for us. And um, there's a couple of different bypasses in here and we'll talk very briefly about them before we continue. The first bypass is that nowhere in here are we actually calling PowerShell directly from the Word document with VB. We are not gonna do that. We are, however, using command shells to download this client.txt file from a local trusted internal uh, you know, file share. And then that command gets executed by these command shells that are here. So this actually does bypass um, a lot of different technologies and allows this PowerShell command to be executed straight out um, with, uh, with no blocking it whatsoever. Okay, and obviously also, if you're looking at this from a static standpoint, there is no word PowerShell in here. So if you're looking at it from a gateway, an email scanner type thing, or even statically on the endpoint, there's not gonna be a command in here that's gonna get picked up. Now, the same thing here with this. Wscript.shell uh, wscript is utilized a lot maliciously, and that is what, like, for example, Windows Defender would pick up on the endpoint, or a lot of different gateways will see that in the file as it examines strings and will actually stop this file from coming through, which is fantastic. However, it is so very easy to bypass this. And really all you have to do is take the command or this variable string here and just break it up into a bunch of different concatenated strings. So instead of seeing WScript be in here, we can simply change the layout and just say this variable is now built up of multiple concatenated strings. The first one is a W, then an S, then a C. And in fact, we can actually see this happen. This is kind of fun. This is something I, I just did this morning as a, as a guess, and it actually did work. And I think it was, I think it helped people out a bit. We can actually watch this develop. Okay, so when we start this, we're gonna run this in debug mode so we can actually step through the code. When we start this um, macro, we can see that two variables were created, actually three variables were created in memory, but two of them are be, gonna be the ones that we are interested in. The first one is the command, which shouldn't be that bad. It should just come straight down. The second one is the run string variable, and we're gonna keep an eye on this field right here as I step through the code. Okay, so we're gonna step through. So the first one, we're gonna come down, we're gonna execute and create that variable, and you'll see the variable just drop right down here, 
that string as is, just like it appears up there on uh, in the actual source code itself. The second one, when we step into it and convert it, you'll see now that it took all those different little concatenated strings and put them back together into a command that is usable uh, to actually do some damage. So in this case, the only time you're gonna actually see wscript.shell is at execution time. You will not see it statically. So that's a great way to see how that um, uh, obfuscated variable is actually created at runtime. It's kind of a cool way to do that. Hope you guys like that. All right, so we're gonna stop the debugger and, and exit out of the macro. Now, just like last week, you're gonna to wanna to put something in here that's gonna cause the user to really wanna open the and enable the macros. I'm sure you guys have seen lots of examples of um, you know, really cool images. You, know, you really need to open this, it's okay, it's trusted, all that kind of stuff. Uh, last week we used my cows, this week we'll use a picture of my back deck here in Montana uh, where you can see my barbecue under a little bit of snow. Uh, and then we're just gonna save this file. Again, very important if you wanna really get past the smarter users, instead of saving this as a macro enabled docm, just save it as an old 2003.doc file and there won't be a different icon on the file or anything like that. In fact, where are you? There you are. Okay, so there's our weaponized document. Okay, built. Now, on the left, we're going to see uh, a connection to our web dev server to go grab the client.txt. The client.txt then gets executed by the macro with the W script code, which is then going to execute the PowerShell download to go get the client, the PS1 client from the web server on 8090. And as that PS1 executes, we then get a callback from the reverse shell into Trevor C2 server, if all goes well and works. So we'll open our document and here is our standard, you know, Microsoft security warning. We've you know, done a very good job of, of teaching our end users to, you know, when they see this, don't click on this, don't click on this. But again, it's up to the social engineering that, it, that is here in this picture or whatever it is that is very successfully able to trick users into clicking enable macros. It happens a lot every day. This is, this is one of the most popular methods of getting bad code into uh, a, a victim's environment. Okay. so. We're going to click enable content. And very, very quickly what we see is we get a visual basic error and we see a process action blocked down here at the bottom of the screen. And in fact, what has happened here is a silence protect technology called script control has actually seen uh, the malicious uh, macro attempted to be executed in this document and has actually blocked it from executing. So the macro never did execute so that we never got a connection to the web dev, we never got the, cl the client downloaded, we never executed it, et cetera. Now, there are a lot of different technologies out there that are capable of blocking macro script and PowerShell and other things like that. The problem is, is if you actually have a legitimate use for macros in your environment, um, simply blocking it means that you're taking out part of your business. So in this case, uh, silence script control is actually smart enough to recognize malicious use versus normal use in, in a lot of cases. And so here in this case, we get with this document, uh, we opened it up and it has exactly the same security warning. So, you know, thank you, Microsoft. There's nothing in this that says, one document is worse than the other. It just says there's a piece of technology here and you should be very careful about using it. And that unfortunately gets left up to the end user who can be easily tricked into executing that code. So if you're using a technology that simply blocks macros, um, then you wouldn't be able to use this macro, which actually if you keep an eye um, on, these, on these initials here and on this letter B, this macro is a legitimate kind of business use macro um, that if you enable the content, all it does is it pulls your initials and your username from your Active Directory 
account and drops it into your document for you so you don't have to type your name over and over again. So again, this is a legitimate macro that is in this document. It doesn't do anything malicious and therefore Silence allows it to actually execute without blocking it. So you have a legitimate use, but you still get um, blocked with a malicious use. Okay, now it's time to have just a little bit of fun. We're actually going to now uh, actually pop over into our Silence console and we're going to disable script control. Uh, I don't recommend doing this. Uh, scripts are one of the easiest ways for bad stuff to get into your environment. But in this case, I want to actually disable script control. And to do that, we're just going to switch over to a different policy that has script control in detection mode only, not blocking mode. So we're only going to detect the bad script. We're actually not going to stop it from running. So on our hapless victim, we're gonna just make sure we get the latest policy. And then we'll check very quickly the about box and make sure that, yep, we do have that script control off policy. So we're intentionally going to bypass a piece of silence technology that is designed to protect you from bad scripts. Uh, and we're just gonna turn that off and see what happens. Okay, now, in this case, we saw a couple of different things happen, and I would actually be surprised if we didn't see the PS1 get downloaded here and maybe even a callback, which a lot of people would consider a bypass, but it doesn't look like it got that far. This is a different response. What you see now is you see Silence Optics popping in here, and what Silence Optics has actually done, and this is, by the way, a customizable message, uh, on the screen, you can tell them to call a phone number or whatever. I just have this text in here. Um, but what Optics has done has actually uh, stopped the attack from proceeding, even though we allowed the macro script to actually run. So you can see here that we actually detected it, but it was actually allowed to execute. So you saw the web dev get downloaded. You saw a DOS box pop up with that funky looking um, PowerShell command but it was actually stopped in plain sight. Uh, and if we look at our process list, we do not have uh, CMD EXE running and we do not have um, PowerShell EXE running and that is fantastic. So Optics actually stepped in and stopped that uh, from running. And now let's just bounce over real quick to our console and hopefully we have uh, in our optics detections, we should have the, um, the detection here. Yep, there it is. And so here is the optics detection that actually shows what happened. And so on our victim, we saw command exe attempt to execute a PowerShell encoded command. And here is the actual command captured and archived for your evidence later, whatever you need to do. But most importantly, rather than saying, okay, you've had this event happen, now Mr. Human, you need to go figure out um, what to do about it. You're in response, you know, you need to figure out what type of response. In this case, I've actually configured optics to automatically respond by terminating the processes. So this is why even though it was attempted to execute, we do not see those processes running and we did not get that call back into Trevor C2 because Optics saw this attempt and killed the process before it could actually continue and execute. And so that is what a prevention first type of detect and respond looks like. It's not gonna wait for humans to respond, it's actually going to respond itself by what you told it to actually do. Now, in this case, for example, here is the PowerShell download, and I told it here to terminate the process, um, and also any process tree and pop up that customizable notification window. What I could have also done is told it to respond with what we call playbooks. Now, when you respond as a human to an incident, you pull out a three ring binder probably, and you run down a list of things to do grab this file, copy it to this location, get this file, execute this, upload this file, do this, 
as part of your evidence gathering techniques. Silence Optics has the ability to actually respond with technology rather than paper and humans. So even though it killed the processes, all that kind of stuff, you could actually then go build these playbooks and actually have um, all of that stuff done for you um, based upon you know, how you decided to uh, respond. So you can create playbooks and have it upload programs, execute them, drop data files. You can upload data to you know, S3 buckets, whatever you do. Um, but it's really cool to be able to see the product actually terminate processes and then go gather all the evidence and things like that that you need uh, to continue uh, your uh, living. Okay, so that is Trevor C2 with a weaponized document. And we're just gonna clean up our mess over here of fuzz and move on with our demo, which is pretty cool. Everything is working just fine today. So that is hiding in plain sight with Trevor C2 and malicious documents. Okay, some more playing in memory. We actually played in memory a little bit earlier um, but this one is an interesting one because when we looked at this one, the attacker was not looking for a vulnerability in a program that was installed on the victim. They actually wrote their own program with an intentional vulnerability inside of it. They intentionally created a buffer overflow that they then used to execute their shellcode and gain remote control over that network. So uh, very interesting. So on this one, there wasn't really a publicly available tool that creates its own buffer overflow. So we wrote one that actually does um, does do this. And I'm, I'm working right now to see you know, when we can release this out. Hopefully we can do that pretty soon for you guys to get, but it's really a very basic little executable. Um, the next gens that were involved in this uh, completely missed all of the memory attacks that occurred, including the, the buffer overflow, the permissions change, and even failed to detect the Metasploit shellcode um, that was being attempted to execute. So again, same identical setup as before. We're gonna use our uh, attacker and victim. And so let's go look at self-exploiter. All right, self-exploiter, pretty fun little tool. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna set up our website to deliver self-exploiters executable to our victim. Again, very simple little Python web server, port 8080. Okay, so we have the ability to get it to our client and now we're gonna generate our shell code. And basically we're gonna use uh, MSF Venom, just like we did before. But this time we're going to take the output in hex code format and create a variable called fun. So it's gonna take just a few moments to create. And I'll make that a little bit bigger. So you can basically see now we've got our Metasploit shell code and we're creating this variable called fun. So we're just gonna copy that into memory. And we've got our um, we've got our uh, source code sitting here, and we're going to make a 64-bit exe. So we're going to put this into our 64-bit source code. And where we have to put this is just right in here, someplace where we basically just paste in that variable with all of its good information there, and we should be good to go. So again, this is source code that we wrote. Uh, basically, it's just a very simple EXE that creates its own buffer overflow so that we have uh, an exploit into memory where we can then get in and do some API changes to change the permission in memory and execute our shell code. So the, next, the last thing that we're going to do is we are going to compile and build a... Uh, an EXE from it directly on our Kali Linux box. So we now have this nice little EXE that we are going to use on our victim. Okay. Go to our Kali box, grab our self fun 64, 
save it to the desktop. And one of the things you're gonna see is hopefully if I catch it in time, uh, Silence Protect does not actually see a threat here. Um, if you remember last week, we actually did get caught by Windows Defender uh, with a generic signature that picked up the Metasploit payload. So instead of actually detecting something malicious, it just said, oh, you got a payload in that file that matches um, a known Metasploit signature, and therefore we're going to do that. And you can see here, actually, Silence is actually right now looking at this file, and it doesn't see anything malicious in it because there is no malicious code in this file. It's only at runtime when it attempts to behave badly. So let's go ahead and execute it. And very quickly, you can see, you know, process terminated. Um, oh, I didn't start our netcat listener. I am sorry. I wanted to make sure. Okay, so we need to make sure we start our netcat listener to listen for any callback. We'll execute it again. Again, process terminated right away. We don't see any reverse shell coming back into our attacker here in the upper left. And you can see here that, uh, you know, self fun exe uh, was terminated. And again, that is due to the stack protection. Basically the buffer overflow was not allowed to occur. Um, the, the attempts to change permissions and memory were not allowed to occur, et cetera. So, that's self fun being blocked by silence protect anti exploitation techniques and self exploiter. Okay, we are running short on time, but I do want to get through this. So this was the big bang. And what this was, was basically, um, Stuart said, you know, go uh, take a previous method and exfiltrate some data, destroy the system, do it in less than five seconds and do it on a Windows 10 box that's fully protected with uh, Windows Defender and all the latest uh, upgraded Emmet technology and anti-exploitation memory defenses and all that stuff that comes with 1809. And so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to switch over and do that really quickly. So uh, we're going to switch over. Here is our Windows 10 victim, just like Stuart wanted me to do. Uh, this time we do have Silence Protect installed. And we do have it running our default policy for our demo. Script control is on. It's everything is ready to go. Uh, and let's take a look at a couple of differences here in the system. So we do see, if we go to our about box down here at the bottom of the screen, we do see Windows 10 version 1809. So latest and greatest with all the new protection mechanisms. Uh, virus protection here, um, we actually do have, if we go look in here, we don't have anything from Microsoft under here because Silence Protect is installed. So uh, basically Windows Defender antivirus is disabled uh, because of Silence Protect. Now, in the app and browser control, these are still enabled. And in fact, even though Silence Protect is on the system, uh, protecting from exploits, we also still have all of the default Microsoft technology that's here as part of Windows 10 as well. And it's, we're configured to be basically where the defaults uh, in the system are as they come from Microsoft. So all these different methods to protect memory uh, are still active on the system along with Silence Protect. So same thing here that we just did on our Windows 7 victim. We're just gonna drop over to our Kali box and we're gonna grab um, self fun 64. Now, sometimes this goes really slow. I don't know what it's trying to do, but maybe if we go by the IP address, well, come on, figure it out, Windows. I don't know why, but it, for some reason, Windows 10 likes to do fun things. Um, yeah, let's try edge even. Stop, stop, stop. Wow. Come on, Windows 10. There we go. Okay, whatever. It does something weird. I have no idea. All right. Save it to the desktop. Now, remember, if you were on last week, this is when Windows Defender stepped in and said, hey, self fun 64 exe contained Metasploit, so uh, yeah, not good. So then it took it out. 
Um, this time we didn't get Windows Defender block it. We have Protect on the box, essentially doing the anti-malware component. But Protect doesn't see anything bad either in this file. However, we try to execute it. Um, here, very quickly again, we get process terminated because uh, Silence Protect steps in and stops, um, you know, self fun from actually doing its its fun stuff in memory. Uh, and even though Microsoft didn't stop it, Silence Protect is there to stop it with the way that we look at memory a little different. So we never did get our call back into our Netcat. Everything is fine. The system is prevented, uh, even though uh, Microsoft's latest and greatest memory protection techniques uh, were essentially bypassed. Uh, luckily, we had silence on there. So this time, we did not get to actually exfiltrate data like we did last week, and we didn't destroy the system, and that's a great thing to have happen. So we didn't actually lose our career today in less than five seconds, and that's because we had silence on the system doing its job. Okay, so... Uh, with silence, prevention is key. In fact, I did a talk this week on Tuesday in Portland, Oregon, um, where one of another vendor was there talking about best practices and techniques in malware remediation. And I kind of chuckled at that and I said, well, the best remediation is to prevent it in the first place. Then you don't have to actually go through and put your registries back and restore systems and all that kind of stuff. So um, at Silence, we're focused heavily in prevention. Prevention is the key. And so do not rely on tools that simply detect and respond and require humans to intervene or even cloud connections to figure out what's going on. Rely on tools that can not only uh, prevent the execution of bad things, but also detect and respond automatically and especially respond automatically with all of the tools and techniques that you're going to use as a human, just imagine the amount of time saving you can have if all that evidence data is waiting for you ready uh, and the attack didn't actually succeed, but you still have all that evidence. Uh, watch out for whitelisting. Whitelisting is sounds great on paper, but when it comes down to actually using it, it's very difficult to deploy and is easily bypassed by utilizing living off the land techniques like DLL side loading or hijacking uh, or today you saw MSHTA get around a lot of that type of technology. Using GPOs to enforce policies around DDEs and macros is fine, but that is a you know very draconian black or white. If you disable them, you disable them. You are not allowed to run good macros and block bad ones. So please keep an eye out for that. Signing of approved internal scripts. We talked about it last week, about it being good for doing things like protecting the integrity of your internal IT scripts. However, with Silence technology, the signing becomes very important. So you actually could, with Silence, block all of the use of PowerShell and macros and other scripts on the system, but by checking in the signing certificate into the Silence console, signed scripts that are signed with that certificate will still be allowed to run. So if you did want to simply disable macros and PowerShell and all that kind of stuff for your end users, you're not blocking all of your internal scripts uh, from running. Lastly, again, do not rely on technology that requires the cloud. It's okay to have technology that is slightly enhanced by the cloud, like Silence. We actually do use the cloud, we use our cloud, um, but it's only for an enhancement. It is not for all of the prevention techniques. And in fact, Optics, with its context analysis engine that's on the endpoint, would have done all of the prevention, all of the executing of all of the playbook uh, information, all of that, on the endpoint without even having a connection into the cloud. But I wanted to show you what the event looks like when it was in the console, so I had it connected to our console. But it's not required. So do not rely on solutions that rely on the cloud because if that cloud goes away, you're then based upon, uh, your prevention will be based upon, you know, 20 year old signatures, dats, and rules that are on the endpoint. So, what is next? Hacking Exposed. Obviously, we, we're doing these a couple of times a quarter at least. So please do come look for new Hacking Exposed webinars on uh, at silence.com slash webinar. 
Also, we have lots of other very cool webinars that are happening every week. So please do check that out. Come see us and we will be happy to visit with you. Stuart McClure, uh, myself, Brian Robison, follow us on uh, Twitter if you want. Reach out to me on email. My email was in the deck at the very beginning. Again, you're going to get a copy of it. So if you need that, um, please do that. Uh, we do not have time right now for question and answer because I do want to allow you guys to get back to your days. Um, so if there are any questions, feel free to email me or we will reach out to you uh, for the questions that were asked in today's session. So thank you all very much for attending today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to uh, come see Silence Technology in action against some of the latest and greatest threats that were essentially designed to bypass uh, a lot of the next gen technology. And once again, thank you from BlackBerry Silence. We hope to see you all on our next webinar. Thank you very much.